Good evening, everyone. My name is Patty Prado, and I'm the president of the Native American Art Council of the Portland Art Museum. We welcome you here tonight to an evening with Preston Singletary and David Franklin. As we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge that we are on land that belong to the indigenous people of this area. With that recognition, I would like to call on Greg Archuleta to give us a blessing. Greg is a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and also a member of the museum's Native Art Advisory Board. Thank you, Greg. Please stand as you are able. Sahayam Kanawe Tilikum. Naga Miss Light Kabastus Tum Tum Naga Miss Light Yakwa Uksan. I just wanted to first welcome you in our tribal language, the Chinookwawa, that we speak on the reservation. And uh, as mentioned, my name is Greg Archuleta, a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. And if you're not familiar with our tribe, we uh, are the tribes um, whose ancestral homelands you're standing on today of the Chinookan people, including the Maknomas, the Oregon City Tumwaters, the Clackamas and Fwatlala people. And then as you go over the West Hills there, across the summit there, the Tualatin Kalapuya country. So on behalf of the tribe, I wanna welcome you all here today and thank um, the council for the invitation um, to come and, and, and share um, some words with you. And um, it'll be great to, um, um, have the sharing from the, the two artists today and looking forward that, to that this evening. But to begin the evening, I'll go ahead and do a blessing and I'll do it in our tribal language um, and just to kind of, of course, recognize the land, our elders, the water, um, the food that we eat, and of course the friendship that we have here um, and that everybody um, shares as they can and has a good heart and mind. Sahali Tai, Hayamasi Puskanaway Uksan, Hayamasi Puskanaway Telecom Pluska, Chagu Kanamox Duksan, Hayamasi Pus Uk Ilihi, Pikanaway Uk Ilihi, Pollets and Tsaika Telecom, Natsaika Kam does Kaba Uk Natsaika Ul Telecom, Pikanaway Fluskam, Monkslus Pus and Tsaika Telecom Pus Uksan. Hayamasi pus kanawe makmak natsaika tu an uksan. Hayamasi pus mox tilikum fleska chagu pi fleska makkam ducks kaba kaba fleska tilikum pi pi kara fleska monk. Hayamasi pus kanawe tsok pi natsaika kam ducks kaba natsaika tilikum uksan pi kanawe Hilamas and Saika Monk Uksan, P. Hayumasi Pus Fluska Chagu Uksan, P. Kanaway Telecom Fluska Hilamas Kabad and Saika Hayumasi. Thank you, Greg. Well, we have a large, diverse, and distinguished crowd here tonight, and we again welcome you. Of course, Clinket Dancing Staff didn't just appear by magic overnight. It was the work of a longtime collaboration with the artist, with the developer of the Diane Apartments, John Carroll, who is here with us tonight. John, perhaps you could give us a wave. I don't know, there you are. Um, the City of Portland and the Regional Arts and Culture Council, otherwise known as RAC. And we'll hear a little bit more about that collaboration from a um, representative of RAC shortly. I'd like to do a few thank yous. To bring you this evening's work has also, this evening's event has also been the work of many hands. I'd like to recognize our Vice President and Program Chair, Elaine Janiak. <laughs> Let's give her a hand, yes. <laughs> Kristen Calhoun of the Regional Arts and Culture Council. You can wave. You can give the royal wave if you want. Um, Philip Hilaire, a member of our council. I don't know if he's here yet tonight, but he's on his way. 
<clears throat> our hospitality chair, Liz Lambert, and Dave Lambert as well, who ably assist. <clears throat> Selene Rabago of the Preston Singletary Studio, and many other council members who helped in this. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge museum staff, Jan Quivy, who is our council coordinator, and <clears throat> Chris Nicholson, the director of the audiovisual services. So again, let's give them all a hand. Again, we have representation from the Native American leadership in our community. We have representatives from our council, from the Northwest Art Council, from the Contemporary Art Council and other councils. We have the Oregon Glass Guild represented. We have local artists and friends and family of the artist. So again, thank you all for coming. The Native American Art Council has been in ex existence since 1984 and we support the museum's outstanding, if I may say, collection through a variety of activities, programs such as this, supportive exhibitions, acquisitions for the museum, and if any of you are not members, we would encourage you to join us in our endeavors, and we have some information at the table in the back or speak to any of our board members, or our members. Several people have asked me about our streetcar adventure, and I will go more into details of that for those who would like a tutorial um, at the end of the program, so we'll get to that point. I'd now like to introduce Kristen Calhoun, Director of Public Art for the Regional Arts and Culture Council, to tell us a little bit more about this collaboration. Thanks, Patty, and welcome, everyone. So the Regional Arts and Culture Council is your regional um, arts council, I guess the name says it. Um, and one of the things we do is to work with the city of Portland on um, regulatory issues. Sounds kind of boring. But sometimes those regulatory issues um, interface with artwork. So in this case, John Carroll was building a, a building that he was using a floor area ratio transfer. This is a code thing. This is the sort of nerdy side of what we do. Um, and in doing that, the design review board said, we think that you're getting a great deal in doing this larger building, and we would like to see you do something back for the community. And we would like to see you do a public art piece, and we would like to see you do it in the location where the work is. So um, we worked with John and went through a process of looking at multiple different artists and John and a handful of people that were looking at this decided that Preston Singletary would, would be the artist for this project. And then Preston came back to us and said, well, you know, I want to do this project, but I would really like to work with um, David Franklin. And we said, well, bonus, because David Franklin is also someone we'd been looking at, and so, yay. So um, I know that Paul is going to introduce David and um, um, Preston, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that, that background. So it is um, a private-public partnership. It is the city of Portland and design review looking out for the citizens and saying, we think we need, we need more. Um, and so, yay, John Carroll steps up and says, yeah, you're right, we do, and I'm happy to do it. I, I think he seemed pretty happy all the way through. <laughs> so um, so I'm, I'm happy to take a quick question if anyone has a question about that, but otherwise, I think you're really here to hear these two. Okay, thank you. Yes, and now Paul Lumley, who is a member of the Yakima Nation and also of our council, will introduce our artist. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to actually invite the artists up. If Preston and David could come up and stand next to me, that would be great. I'm going to introduce them in the order they appear up there. So David Franklin, who I met today, 
uh, for the first time, um, is an amazing artist and uh, does art on a monumental scale. Uh, he started creating public art in his teens as a member of the graffiti crew. That's what it said on your website, and I <laughs> hope that's the legal part of your art. It's long ago. It's <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> um, his passion is to connect with humanity through large-scale installations and moved from Denver to Seattle in the 1990s, and his work is inspired by nature and also by native culture, and he's done several collaborations with uh, other native artists. And your mentor is uh, Dwayne Pascoe. Yes. Uh, who uh, was part of the revival of uh, Northwest Coastal Art, and uh, he created monumental freestanding and integrated sculptures, amazing work. And um, if you haven't had a chance to go down to the waterfront and see the Rippling Wall, you should do it. I went and saw it today. It's on the East Bank Esplanade, and it's an amazing installation. Uh, it was a partnership of RAC, uh, also with the Portland Fire Department and uh, Welton Architects, and it really is an inspiring uh, work of art. Uh, there were a lot of challenges with that piece of work, and um, I'm so glad David didn't get discouraged, and he came back to Portland and did this amazing collaboration with Preston. So how about a warm welcome for David Franklin? <laughs> Uh, next, I'd like to say a few words about Preston Singletary, who is Tlingit, and uh, has grown up in the Seattle area, and I've known Preston for many years. Uh, my husband, Philip, who is late, um, will be here soon, but he introduced us many years ago, and I was uh, introduced to him not necessarily through his glass art, but more through his print art and also his music. Uh, he has his own band, and he plays in his band. They have three albums. It's called Kuik. Did I pronounce that correctly? And I've had the pleasure of listening to his music a couple of times, and he's really talented, and I don't know how you do it. I'm just exhausted even telling people about this, but you have an incredible energy. <laughs> um, uh, Preston actually became uh, school friends with another amazing glass artist and famous as well, Dante Marioni. Uh, they met in high school and became friends and eventually Preston started working for his studio and got to uh, know the uh, joys of working with glass. That became a passion of his. He ended up going to uh, the Pilchuck Glass Studio in 1984 as a workshop. And from there, he just has blossomed and has traveled throughout the world and ended up going to Sweden as one of those stops and met his wife over here, Osa, and his daughter, and sitting right next to their daughter. They're both here, so thank you for being here with your family, Preston. And um, I forgot to mention, David, your wife is also here. Could you raise your hand? Thank you. <laughs> we got the whole family. <laughs> Um, a few weekends ago, I was really blessed to go to um, a gala fundraiser for the um, Museum of Glass in Tacoma. And uh, of course, they have incredible galas. I love going to them. But this particular one, Preston was featured uh, with his new glass exhibit called Raven and the Box of Daylight. And it truly is amazing. How long will it be there? To the end of uh, August next year. To the end of August next year. So you really need to go check this out. It was moving uh, for me. It's a great experience. And it will make your heart grow when you see that art. So how about a round of applause for Preston Singletary for being here. And how about a warm welcome for both of them as a collaboration? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So Preston Ach Sayi Schlinket Ke Nach Kochain Duasok Kagwantana Hutsiti and Sierra Kwan Ayahat. It's a little brief this uh, introduction in Klinket. Um, thank you, David, for that, that welcoming and the blessing, uh, welcoming us to your ancestral lands. Um, and, uh, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for everybody making this come together. Um, I've been showing in Portland over the years in various capacities, all the way back in the late 90s with the, uh, or no, was that the late 80s? 90s? I'm losing track. Used to have a... a um, a native art festival out on the on the park streets, but that was a long time ago. So long ago, I can't remember. <clears throat> oh, it was late late nineties. That anyway. <laughs> Thank you. It's always good to have your wife around to correct you. <clears throat> Thank you, wives, for being here. Thank you for my family for being here. Um, 
So anyways, this is kind of a new presentation. I was asked to do a bit of a, um, an overview of um, uh, Native American well, glass art that happens to be native, <laughs> made by Native Americans. Um, so this was my little quick overview, uh, the variety of, of artists that, um, that uh, work with glass. This, this was Tony Hohola, and, and to my knowledge, Tony is the longest working Native American glass artist um, around. Um, these are artists that actually make the glass, blow glass, so he's, Tony has is, is led a Pueblo, um, and uh, you know, quite honestly, the, 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 the era that we're in with this uh, glass art, as we call it, is just roughly over 50 years old. Prior to that, it was really um, designers and master craftsmen. There was, and then they came together, you know, the, the designers were educated to work in different mediums. Um, and about just a little over 50 years ago, Harvey Littleton went uh, to Europe um, and came back. Uh, he was and built a, a little studio in Kent State, Ohio. It's just a little over 50 years ago. And he started to teach um, or make sculpture that was that he made himself, not by the you know anybody else and he would present it as glass art. So that's kind of the era. So Tony's probably been working maybe, I don't know, about 40 years. If I've been working about 35 years now, maybe. He's been working probably about 40. Anyway, Tony Hola is led a Pueblo. Um, and a lot of this work that he does, you know, he, he came up and worked with uh, Dale Chihuly, attended the Pilchuck Glass School, and, um, you know, came from a very traditional, from the Pueblo, from the, the reservation in, in uh, Isleta Pueblo in Santa, or in New Mexico. And, um, you know, long line of artists. His father was a silversmith, and these are some of the stamps that his father made for his uh, jewelry pieces, and they're, he stamped them in the glass, and then drew these designs with um, canes and so forth, making the patterning of the, of the, uh, uh, Pueblo styles. Um, Doug Coffin was also um, an artist who, this is a mixed media piece, a piece that he made probably in the, the early 80s, and it, was, it represented several different moons. This was uh, uh, work I think he even had maybe done in um, uh, university when he was a student, also out of um, the New Mexico region. Um, and then Larry Avacana. And when I first went to Pilchuck in 1984, I met both Tony and Larry Avacana. And Larry Avacana was uh, in Yupiat, which is from the very far north uh, of Alaska, in Barrow, Alaska. And so this is a piece that he made, which rec you know, reflects you know, different um, sort of petroglyphs and, and a lot about the, uh, the landscape of the, of the the frozen tundra of the north. Um, so when I met those guys in 1984, I wasn't even really doing anything uh, related to my cultural background. I was just more about, um, yeah, playing music, trying to become a rock star, but that didn't ever pan out for me. So I kind of fell back in my art career. I basically, um, uh, um, you know, so I was working as a glass blower, assisting many, many different people. Uh, in the Seattle area, learning through practical experience. But I met Tony and Larry that the first time I ever went to Pilchuck. And so it, to me, it just was natural. It, I, it didn't occur to me that they're the only two guys, Native American guys, that might be working in glass. And then there was me. So um, anyway, this is, you know, kind of represents the, the, the horizon, the frozen landscape and the water. Uh, it's Larry's work. Um, Conrad House was a uh, Navajo man who, who's passed away, uh, but he was at Pilchuck uh, as well uh, sometime in that early 80s time frame, and he he played a lot with glass. Um, and a lot of these a lot of these pieces that um, I'm showing you uh, into about 2000 and. 
two, I think it was, we had an overview of Native American glass art. We had an exhibition that we put together called Fusing Traditions, and I worked together with some curators, and the uh, exhibition went to uh, San Francisco the Museum, Museum of Folk Art. Um, this is Susan Point, who is from the, uh, the Salish tribe of BC. Um, you know, spindle whirl form that was, so I also saw her work um, in galleries as, you know, uh, and it sort of prompted my curiosity about like how, you know, how could you get these designs into the glass? Um, uh, Ramson Lomotewama is a Hopi native, also uh, met him up at Pilchuck in the mid 90s. Um, and then there was Marvin Oliver who, Oddly enough, we were kind of passing in different circles, but never ever really met. And he went to my friend Dante Marioni um, and asked uh, about having Dante help him blow into this form, this uh, uh, this mold that he had made. And um, and Dante said, "Yeah, I got a friend who's uh, who's native too." Uh, but it still took you know several years before we actually met each other. Um, this is actually a water jet cut form. Uh, so it's transparent glass that's been cut out, plotted out by a, a computer, and then put back together like a puzzle, and then fused back together. So it's actually melted back together. So it's about six foot tall standing uh, killer whale fin. Um, really spectacular. So some of these artists, you know, they don't blow the glass. Maybe, maybe they don't handle it or fabricate it themselves, but they design in it. So I'm showing just really... Um, a broad variety of you know the capabilities of what what glass can do. Um, Wayne Price was a clinket uh, guy who was a carver worked on this uh, uh, project with me at the Pilchuck Glass School. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Brian Barber is a Pawnee uh, went to, to university and um, uh, studied glass making and started to connect his his culture to. Um, the uh, material of glass. And then this is Marcus Ammerman, who I call the original glass artist, because I always contend that Native American culture has this defining historic connection to glass, and it came through trade beads. And these trade beads were, um, were of tremendous value to the, the culture and the community, and was adopted into, um, <clears throat> you know, ornamenting um, clothing and garments, objects, um, and so this kind of takes it into a whole new level, like a, con a conceptual level, and Marcus is an incredible um, conceptual artist as well as working across different mediums. There's Robert Tannehill, and all of, all of this work was, again, done prior to about 2003, um, and uh, Robert was a, a student of mine up at the Pilchuck Glass School, um, and then uh, uh, Joe Davis, New Chanulth from the west coast of Vancouver Island, it's, uh, uh, also became one of my most important mentors uh, in the summer of 2000. Um, Ed Archie Noise Cat, uh, we worked on this piece together. He actually carved that form out of wood, and then we turned it into a, a mold that we could both uh, work with um, and changing the design. Um, and color, you, know, you can get different kinds of effects. So this is one that was executed with his design style, and then sometimes I would take those and I would also um, execute them in my my own cultural style. <clears throat> and Clarissa Rizal, this is another. This is this is a, a beadwork curtain, but it's really massive, and I thought it was pretty impressive. Um, you know, playing with the form line and sort of painting with light. So at one point I interviewed a lot of these artists and asked them, you know, what attracts, what attracts them to the material of glass? Like I know what, it, what attracts me to the material, the medium, but um, you know, and a lot of people come back to the idea that that plays with the light, interacts with the light, uh, you're sort of painting with the light in this case. Um, Ira Luan who's a Taos Pueblo artist who um, was a student of Tony Hohola's um, and has become really prolific in the past few years and you know er experimenting with his sculptural style uh, just super super um, amazing you know hardworking guy um, lots of lots of sculptural styles 
Um, this is another one of his pieces, playing with all those different techniques of um, drawing those little li that line work on there, creating all those patterns with um, little rods of glass. And then there's Raven Sky River, who is uh, another guy, the more up and comer. Um, he's been working with glass probably only, I mean, over maybe 15 years or so, maybe a little longer than that, but just an amazing um, sculpture uh, and, you know, working with colors of glass and creating these, these kinds of pieces. Um, a lot of uh, uh, sea life, you know, different animals and what have you. And then, <clears throat> so as it kind of is blossoming now with, with a lot of interest in, in native or, or glass, um, glass art, this Virgil Ortiz who had a, um, a, uh, a residency at the Corning Museum of Glass. They created actually a, um, a residency program for Native American or indigenous glass makers. And so these were made by a team over in the East Coast and uh, Corning Museum. Um, Dan Friday is a Lummi native who is Washington State. Um, has been working with glass many, you know, probably 30 plus years and has finally really come into his own in terms of making his own work and, and uh, developing his own style. And he was also a student of mine up at Pilchuck uh, many years ago. Lillian Pitt, and these were, uh, uh, she's a local uh, native artist um, working in ceramics and also in glass, I think other materials as well. But this was a project that they, he, she and Dan Friday put together, uh, playing with some of her imagery. Um, so you can see there's like quite a, a broad variety of, um, of, you know, ways of interpreting, you know, the, the cultural styles. So this is one of her castings from one of her carvings, or perhaps it was a, uh, a ceramic piece. So part of my, <clears throat> um, as sort of a, a, an ambassador of glass to other uh, in, indigenous um, people, um, I'm always working with, with people, with other artists when I can. Um, and by doing so, I learn how, you know, how do they interpret their symbols for their, um, for today's market. Um, this was a project that we did at the Pilchuck Glass School in the summer of 2001. This involved uh, carvers from uh, the Alaskan uh, territory up in Haines, Alaska, um, and they brought this totem pole down to the, the um, school. Uh, and this represents the founders of the Pilchuck School. So it was uh, um, Dale Jehuli, uh, uh, John, and Annie Halberg, this is the, the couple at the time, who, uh, uh, so John Halberg was the heir to Weyerhaeuser. He was a, a passionate Northwest Coast native art collector. He, you know, he donated the, the land to which Pilchuck is situated. And he, um, um, with his collection, which he donated to the Seattle Art Museum, there was one dagger that was, they couldn't really track the provenance of it. So he found out who that, that, um, and Dagger originally was uh, who owned it, and he repatriated it. He gave it back to this family up in Angoon. As a result, he was given a Clinket name, um, Gooch Keats, which means dark wolf. And that's the so the bottom figure that you see is John Halberg. He's shown holding this copper form, which is a tana, uh, which denotes the high status of an individual. And it's got this double-headed killer whale dagger that which we asked for you know, permission from the family uh, to uh, carve a version of it. And then we cast it, uh, cast that form, and then we inlaid it into the pole, thereby uh, iterating his connection to the Clinket tribe. And of course, the middle section you can see with the slash across the eyes, Dale Chihuly, you know, as if, you know, Dale, you, most of you probably know he has a patch on his eye. So this was our way of iterating that, that, uh, that idea of the vision of glass or the, um, the connection of glass. He's holding on to this, this diving raven with the sun in its beak. And it's, it speaks to the, uh, 
you know, the idea of Raven brings the light is sort of like Dale Chihuly brought the idea of Pilchuck to the world. And so um, we, we kind of uh, told this story uh, through this totem pole. The top figure is Annie Halberg. Um, and so we created this in the summer of 2000. Um, we had uh, Native American students. Um, I co-taught it with uh, David Svensson, who is the carver of this particular totem pole. Um, so a little bit about the collaborations that for me kicked off this whole uh, process of working with different artists. This is uh, Harlan Rayano. These figures are about 15, 16 inches tall, very complex forms. Um, this is Lewis Gardner is a Maori jade carver. So the green that you see there is actually jade stone that's been inlaid into the glass form. Um, then we started to think about the um, uh, conjoined stories that we have. Um, the, the whale writer, of course, in the New Zealand Maori culture. Um, but then in our culture, we call it Natslane, is the creator of the killer whale. Um, and then, of course, Joe David, who I you know, always enjoy working with. Um, worked on lots of different kinds of forms with him. These are lightning snake dance um, frontlets, headdresses. Uh, Marcus Ammerman from the Choctaw uh, uh, culture, and these are based on his Choctaw um, descendants, or I'm sorry, uh, ancestors. These head pots, which are presumed to be funerary urns. And then um, some interpretations of the Choctaw style pottery forms. Uh, Jody Naranjo, we're gearing up to do an exhibition with her uh, uh, at SOFA uh, in Chicago, which is um, an art fair that happens every uh, November. Um, so a, a new body of collaborative work will be um, uh, displayed there. <clears throat> and Jambua Marwili was an uh, Aboriginal Australian who I got the, uh, became friends with uh, on a trip that I made, a uh, cultural art exchange. Um, and I went to go visit him in the Northern Territory. And uh, so this is kind of reflective of you know, his design style. So, okay, so that's, the, that's a little bit about the, uh, you know, the indigenous art. This is a little bit about my work here. Um, and uh, this is, uh, on the right-hand side is a totem pole that I cast in full scale that uh, represents a story about my great-grandmother. And this uh, central figure here was actually carved by David Franklin who I commissioned to make this form for me. So we work collaboratively on the design and what's it gonna look like. And then we, uh, he uh, carves these pieces for me, or the one in the center here. <clears throat> so this was, um, you know, the, um, the full scale uh, totem that, that I cast um, representing my great grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child. You can see the grizzly bear cub on top. Um, and uh, so she, yeah, grew up in Sitka, moved down to Seattle in the, in the 20s. And from that point forward, she took the whole family with her. My, my grandmother, we all grew up in the, um, in the uh, Seattle area after that. Um, so yeah, playing with a lot of different um, forms and trying to interpret cultural styles, uh, design styles, um, as my, you know, skills evolved as um, over the years, I'm showing you kind of like the cream of the crop here. <laughs> um, the very best pieces, or some of the very best pieces. Um, yeah, playing with different techniques to, you know, to, uh, you know, pay homage to the, you know, the tradition of basketry and these geometric designs. Um, playing with more sculptural uh, forms and getting more complex. Uh, these are, this is a cormorant. Um, um, this is uh, actually a piece that came from that same mold that I did with Ed Noiscat. Um, so you can see it's like more of my interpretation and how I would use that, that piece. Um, kind of playing with a little, you know, a little bit of a play on modernism. Um, you know, the, uh, the modernist movement you know, evolved into this genre of primitivism, which was, you know, reflecting, reflecting on um, 
older cultures, uh, African, Native American, Oceanic cultures, and um, so sometimes I like to play with that feeling of modernism. And in this case, it's more of a kind of a literal interpretation of um, uh, oyster catcher rattle. Um, and of course, Raven stealing the sun, or the moon in this case, um, and uh, Raven stole the stars, the moon, and the sun. Um, and um, that is the theme of the exhibition that is up at the Museum of Glass currently, just opened up last week. Um, so what I've tried to do is to create the thread of this story to, uh, uh, as you walk through the exhibition, it's kind of like a theatrical installation. And so, um, you know, starting with this totem pole and you learn about Raven, who at the time was a white bird. Before he was a black bird, he was a white bird. And so he travels through uh, to the uh, fisherman of the night and to learn about this old man who's hoarding these uh, treasures in his clan house, the sun, uh, the stars, the moon, and the sun. So he goes to the canoe where these uh, fishermen are fishing. He transforms himself into a hemlock needle. Um, he infiltrates the clan house by, um, uh, well, he, the, he floats down the river as a hemlock needle and the daughter scoops up this water and she swallows it and she becomes uh, the hemlock needle, that is, and then she becomes pregnant and gives birth to Raven in the form of a human child. And that's actually a little bit of what the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the piece at the Diane Apartments is, uh, it's got a raven and the, the, red, the red piece is the sun, that represents the sun. Um, so he, you know, he goes and f he spies these boxes one by one, he releases these elements into the night sky and then breaks daylight on the world and then people scatter into different realms, the, you know, the water and the air and the forest and they come, become the animals of those uh, areas and so that's, um, these these figures here represent that transformation um, and the adaption of animal symbols to the clan uh, to represent the different clans and families. And then this is the uh, this is the uh, music project, um, and it's, it's sort of moonlighting as a musician and creating a body of music. You know, this is all you know part of my also part of my artistic expression. Um, and we are a Native American themed group. We, we uh, feature a lot of elements of storytelling and traditional language, um, performance art, and sort of jazz rock kinds of styles. So, um, oh, monumental work. Um, yeah, that was for, that's in the uh, Museum of Glass exhibition. These are some of my first um, uh, a, a public art pieces, uh, and then playing with the idea of the steel and the glass inlays. So this is, was some of the inspiration for the Diane piece. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna, uh, oh, okay, collaboration. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna to get to this collaborative effort here and we'll let David talk a little bit. Um, but this was a piece that also, David also helped me with um, laying out the design for this particular piece which went into a cultural arts center up in Juneau, Alaska. And it's, here it is. Um, this is the largest screen that I'd uh, done and these, um, these uh, uh, glass house posts on either side, David also carved. Um, and they represent um, Clinket warriors. They, they have the eagle and the raven. So you can see on the, the right is the raven and the left is an eagle. Um, and together we, we came up with this, uh, this uh, piece for the uh, Boney Courthouse up in Anchorage, Alaska. So this was, the Diane was the first uh, public art piece that we actually executed together. And then this one was also in the works, so we, we installed this one in, um, uh, when was that? February? Yeah, February. Yeah, February. Um, so I'm gonna let David talk a little bit about this stuff too, so I don't... Uh, I don't have plenty to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm just about, uh, so, okay, so this was... 
this is up in Anchorage, Alaska, and this is the, a courthouse. So, you know, we wanted to bring a little bit of color into the space. Um, so we had two areas that we decided that we wanted to work with. This is up the upper balcony sort of mezzanine area, looking across to the atrium where you enter into the courthouse through the security system. And so we wanted to sort of iterate the idea of a sunrise and like the northern lights. So this was sandblasted design that was then painted um, uh, with enamel paints and then uh, installed these panels up in the, the areas there. <clears throat> there's a large eagle eagle design. And there's, uh, no, that's the placeholder for you to start talking. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me here. It's really something. Uh, I love working with Preston. Preston and I, uh, uh, I, I served a, like a 12 year apprenticeship to a carver named Dwayne Pasco, who was part of the revival. He was mentioned, Paul mentioned him earlier. And Dwayne and several other artists were kind of all part of the same community that Press and I were both part of. So I think we knew about one another for a long time before we actually met, you know, and started working together, of course. But uh, I'd served this apprenticeship, learned how to carve. I got, I, if, like, I, like, Paul said I started with the graffiti crew in Denver where I met my lovely wife. Then we moved to the Northwest and, uh, and she got a real job and I started carving a lot. Uh, but I got really engrossed in all this and part of it was just also to have a better understanding of this place that we all live in, you know, like uh, history didn't start with Lewis and Clark and I think it's important for in, anybody that, that lives here to have a deeper understanding of the history of this place. And I, I spent all these years carving with Duane and doing my own pieces. And I eventually had a show of this kind of work. And it was around that time where I started feeling like, this doesn't really represent me. I'm really representing these other cultures. But uh, I did get this one commission at Grace Harbor College in, uh, in Aberdeen. And to me, it was a shame that there was no representations at that time of Chinook and art forms at all, anywhere, like you couldn't, wasn't really a thing that you could access. It was like always a couple of pieces here or there in the back of the book, you know, and, and it just made me realize too that we live in this area that we had, were really focused on more Northern and Alaskan art forms and that the uh, understanding the identify of local people is actually a much more challenging thing to research and there's a lot less information about it. And so when this commission came up, I, I thought that it would be important at this educational facility to have something that represented the ancient people of this place. So this is basically like representations of all different kinds of Chinookan artifacts and design from paddles to ladle handle creatures and the overall shape is like a, a horn bowl style that's carved from this area. And, uh, and I called it Chinook and Sunset, and that was probably really a totally mistaken name because really it was at that time that they were just beginning to build their big house and a major cultural aware movement was happening artistically and otherwise. So, and, and I had no idea that any of that was going on, but it just shows that you can live in an area for a long time and not really know the history of it when it's right, right in your backyard. But then, you know, my, I really also wanted to do, you know, have a larger vision for my work. And so I got, a, I, I got another public art commission. <clears throat> and this one, I kind of brought some of my graffiti and my greater experience all together in the piece. And this is installed at the Green Hill School in Chehalis, Washington, it's, which is like the juvenile detention center you drive by when you're going up I-5. And the idea was that it's, this is the uh, cultural house of cards. And all the tension within the juvenile facility kind of come along racial lines, but also a lot of the work that they're doing to, to uh, you know, rejuvenate these people is to also have clubs that have pride in cultural communities. So this was kind of a result of hearing about all of that and seeing the, the kids in the facility with playing cards and puzzles and all these kinds of things. But the idea behind this is that, you know, we all have to hold up our part of the cultural house of cards in order for it to work. And without that, it can, it can all just collapse. And so on this side of the cards, you can see that there's these kind of very wide ranging cultural representations from the same groups that are within the facility. 
And then this is the piece that, that Paul was talking about earlier. This is down on the East Bank at Fire Station 21. This is called the Rippling Wall. And I worked, Aaron Welton over there. <laughs> Aaron is the, uh, was the architect of the building. And when I got the commission, I kind of had this idea for doing this massive ripple sculpture. And Aaron and I started working together and figuring out how to actually do that. Aaron had the capabilities of realizing that digitally. And then uh, Kurt Nordquist, my other long-term partner, helped me make the whole thing and figure out how to hang it from this building. And this really became kind of a, a, a life-changing project. And, and interestingly, it's inspired by this rock that's in Stevenson, Washington, that is a petroglyph rock that was actually moved from the other side of the river. And, uh, uh, and I saw this, and it just looked like, you know, like ripples carved in stone. I think it's really eyes of creatures carved onto this rock, but it just r really captured me. And then it kind of shows how, like, this interest in indigenous culture can also lead to a very contemporary expression. And then it, we did a much larger version of this down in San Diego at a hotel on uh, on the waterfront down there. And then Aaron and I have since collaborated on other sculptures. This is Drift Inversion. Oh, Aaron Alta also just works like across the street. <laughs> He's an associate professor of, arch of architecture at uh, PSU. And so Aaron and I have started working together on doing these massive installations. This one's called Drift Inversion and it's 20 some feet wide and 100 and almost 130 feet long. And it's supposed to be a dune landscape turned upside down. That's in Denver. That's in where I grew up. Aaron got to meet my whole family and work with everybody. And Kurt Nordquist also worked on this one as well. So like, as I started getting into these public art jobs, I developed a team and Kurt and Aaron were like crucial to making that happen because it started to be a, a vision and a project bigger than any one person could really handle. And then this piece, I, I've been fortunate enough to get two residencies at uh, the Kohler factory in, Wisconsin, in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. They have this art residency since the early 70s where you can go work in the factory for like three month periods and they set you up with a studio right there where they're making toilets and everything else and you can basically <laughs> make anything that you want. And this is from the second, my second round there. And you can see a little bit of the Aaron Welton there up, up above in the digital design of the, what the fish hang from. But this is called the Ghost School and my wife and I love to fish, and we've always been very inspired by the water and nature. And one of the things that is happening right now is a lot of these forage fish are under a lot of pressure, and the numbers are way down, and it affects everything. It affects salmon, all the larger species, shorebirds, like a lot of these things we just don't have like we, we once did. So the idea behind this was to make the ghost school. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, there's these macaw, nutka, fish rattles that are like a big grid that have fish hung in them. And in some ways, this is very much like kind of derived, expanded version of that. But the fish are all made from the same thing that Kohler toilets are made out of. They're all just ceramics. They went right down the line with all that stuff. It was, <laughs> it was fun. Oh, not that one. Preston, I think you should come up and speak about this. Well, this was just where I took some of the original inspiration for the, uh, for the dance staff, the Clinkett dance staff that is at the Diane. And you can see those posts that are, you know, those poles that are, or wands, they're kind of sometimes called wands. But, you know, they're just like banners that sort of represent the particular uh, clan. Uh, sometimes it's sort of, you know, swayed like, you know, a killer whale fin or, you know, tapped in rhythm with the drums and the dancing and the singing. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, this is actually from Sitka. So this is where, you know, my ancestors came from. That's what uh, I might have looked like, you know, 100 years ago. Um, these, uh, yeah, really dramatic and, and large, you know, it's all about monumentality. So this was why it was such an honor to do, uh, you know, for this to be one of the first, you know, major uh, public art pieces, uh, you know, it's here in Portland. and. Uh, you know, this opportunity to get, uh, um, you know, bigger scale and see what the possibilities were. And also, you know, the, the expanding on, um, you know, the more collaborative, a little bit more collaborative nature with, with uh, David and how we could kind of, and, and of course, Kurt too, was a huge part of this, uh, the engineering, 
and the fabrication of this thing. I think it really, I would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't be honest if I didn't disclose that it really took, I think it took a lot out of all of us. <laughs> it was pretty, uh, but you know, in the end, when it, uh, the installation day came, uh, it just went in, you know, just like a top, you know, it was amazing. So, uh, you know, some of the uh, installation site here and along that, that, that little war, that, that, that wall here, the nearest one is where we're um, uh, installing to some of the maquettes that we made for this particular one. Did you want to talk any more sure, about sure. these ones? Yeah. So, yeah, so Kurt over here suffered greatly for this project. Uh, as, as we were working on this, I mean, we have to integrate the piece to this building, you know, seamlessly as possible to make it look really natural. And there was endless coordination and endless drawing development to make sure that that was all going to happen like a top when we got down there. And, and, and Kurt worked endlessly on these drawings and interacting with the engineers and with the people on site to make sure that all this stuff was dialed in. I mean, it's... This is just the tip of the iceberg. And then the, one of the first things we did after we made the little paper models and everything was we made a lighting model where we just, we made this out of MDF and plastic and then started putting some lights into it to give, get an idea about what the thing was gonna look like. And then once again, Kurt's got this SketchUp model so he, you can cut away, you can see that like there's stiffeners and different things going on inside the piece to make it actually stand up more details of the drawings. And then the glass, the glass comes from Bullseye, it's homegrown Portland glass. And it, uh, the glass pieces all have uh, two layers of glass. There's like a frosted glass on the back, and then there's like a layer of epoxy, like plastic in the middle, just like your car windshield, it's like safety glass. Because anything in public, don't want chunks of glass falling out. So, so the, every piece of glass got engineered like that. And then these pieces that fill, that fill the sculpture would come out, of this, come out of these pieces of glass. And then these are some of the raw cut out metal. The metal all gets, is stainless steel and gets cut out on a, on a water jet machine. That was Kurt's water jet machine. And the glass all gets cut out, numbered pieces and everything there. And then this is the piece as it's first starting to go together with just the basic back and then the side frames. And then the, the, there were some interesting spots like the tip of this bird, it required quite a complex piece to be made to cap that off. And here's Sean standing. <laughs> Sean works, uh, he's a gaffer in Preston Studio, but he came down and helped us work on this thing while we were putting it together doing a little surface prep. It's a big surface. And then this, there's removable panels and like this mock-up, you can kind of see how a panel comes off. The panels can be removed so that in case any piece of glass ever gets broken, the piece can be replaced. And then this is the glass going inside of the piece. See what it looks like. There's Kurt busily working over there. And this is what it took like to move these pieces around. They're all really heavy and you gotta be careful because it's really easy to break the glass. And then this is basically what it looked like in the shop when it was all together the first time. And this is the lighting, lighting process. And I think we were struggling right here with some of these pieces have so much cut out that the piece wants to flex, and when the piece flexes, like we're screwing in, like certain spots would break. And uh, Kurt designed an ingenious idea of bridging over some of these pieces so that there was more stiffness and we didn't really lose any more pieces. There it is, moving. very scary to move this around. <laughs> there it is all packed up in the, in the beautiful trailer from National Sign there. And then this is the piece on the site. And there's John Carroll, I'm sure, nervously making sure that we don't break his building. <laughs> and, and Kurt also, I mean, Kurt 
did an incredible work on this thing because even this piece that attaches to the lower jaw, the bird up there that holds it up is something that Kurt put together and designed so that we could move it around. And there we are on installation day. And you shouldn't drive your bike over those tracks. <laughs> And then there it is, all in place. And lit up. There we go. Does anybody have any questions for either yeah. president? Oh, there's questions. <coughs> questions, questions. <coughs> yeah. Yes, I have a question because I'm, I'm a little bit confused because both of you are so gifted, so talented. Who did what? <laughs> 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 who did what? <laughs> we both did everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're as every collaborative effort comes together. Um, I had the idea for the staff, David, and I talked about the concept, you know, design-wise, what is it going to look like? You know, I'll make a rough sketch. He'll, you know, he'll do a little refinement on it, kick it back to me. I'll ask him to change some of the lines. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, legwork on David's part. He's, you know, working with Kurt, you know, working with engineers on any given project. Um, so it's really just, a, you know, it, it just goes back and forth. You know, there's, each time is different. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. It's not that, you know, I, I just get that you are constantly problem solving because it would seem like it would be quite a <laughs> You could talk about that one. Public art is all pu problem solving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's endless problems to solve. I mean, I mean, essentially everything that you make in this realm is a prototype and it has to be perfect. So there's a... There's a lot of suffering involved. I mean, Kurt, Kurt's lost 10 years of his life off of this project. <laughs> you know, but, but there is, there's all different aspects. I mean, there is a, aspect, a part, a time when the project kind of goes to the construction team and you're over there and we're bleeding on it, working on it, but you know, everybody's got their, their part of it, and, but it's all together too. Yeah, I mean, I, I flunked out of my engineering class that I took in Middle school, no, but uh, I mean, you're, we're always relying on a lot of um, you know uh, contractors to to do certain aspects of things, and so it's about knowing who to go to who can you know get the job done, um, and it's just a big collaboration. But that's really uh, uh, what it takes to get something like this done. Okay, yes. Yes, yeah. so I wanted to ask a question about the collaboration that you did in Alaska on that gigantic panel, yes. which was guarded by the, the two figures protecting the building. Like, where exactly was that? And oh, who? yeah, that was, that's, uh, it's in um, Juneau. It's at the um, Walter Sobolev Center. It's also the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. So it's a public building that um, the interior of that uh, clan house is kind of a performance space or a gathering space, and it's supposed to represent the interior of a clan house, like a traditional... Um, Northwest, you know, Alaskan longhouse. Um, you know, the stairs down to the central fire pit, and it's all hand ads boards on the inside. You know, it's just beautiful. It smells beautiful, like cedar. Uh, but they wanted me to, um, you know, when the when the art call came, it said wanted, you know, one glass house screen uh, with uh, these two house posts, and I was like, well, I wonder who's going to do that because. <laughs> I didn't know anybody uh, who, you know, any other um, artist that was really doing that. So they, are, I, they, they hand tailored it for me. They wanted me to have that commission, that piece. So I made the proposal, I got accepted, but the, also, you know, the, the community. Um, for me, it was sort of like uh, bringing that back to the home community was really special. Um, and it showed that there's uh, an acceptance in, um, you know, this navigation into new materials. Um, Robert Davidson is another prominent, you know, Northwest Coast, uh, he was Haida 
artist, and he did a steel uh, kind of silhouette pattern on the exterior of the building, giant, like three stories tall. And it's you know just spectacular, and that's made out of steel. So it shows, um, you know, in one way, Joe David pointed out that you know, the materials that we use for some of this traditional art is becoming more and more uh, rare, you know, harder to come by, you know, especially like the dugout canoes. You, can, you can't really find, you can hardly find uh, a log big enough to make a dugout canoe these days. And it's certainly not like the big, you know, 40-foot ones that, like one that's at the, uh, um, the Natural History Museum in New York. Um, so we're, we're forced to, to, to look towards new materials. So you'll find, you know, the needs of the people, you know, um, to tell these stories and keep these symbols alive will come in the form of other new materials. I'm a scumbag developer. Uh, so I <laughs> just want to make sure you understood who you were listening to. Uh, each building we've done in, in the past has been tied to something, whether it's Frank Lloyd Wright or Charles Rene McIntosh or, or whoever at the particular, particular time. And we saw an opportunity uh, to build something that we wanted to connect with, with nature. And, and if you get a chance to look at the building a little closer, interior, we did, we did, we did that. The process to go through the art, the public art piece, I had a great deal of trepidation with. I, I've seen public art on, on corners that you wonder what it's there for. You don't have an idea what the connection is to the community. It's, you just walk by it. And when we had, uh, when Kristen put together the, uh, the uh, format for selecting an artist, I do recall we were, gonna, we were going to look at eight or 10 artists in presentations that uh, she was, she'd put together. We saw, it, when we had the formal presentation, we saw the first artist, and that went through in about 30 seconds, and kind of shaking my head. They had two, two images they put on the screen. The first one, I looked at it. The second one, I said, that's it. We're done. We're not talking to any more artists. Uh, I was so impressed with what it is they pulled together to put in a contemporary building how to make that connection, and it's such a strong story. A quick aside is ever since I've seen the art go up, I've been trying to figure out how to buy the building next door and tear it down. <laughs> uh, but the, the uh, pictures they told during the manufacture or the production of it, I went up to the shop as they, as they got to that point, and I just was blown away. The, the detail, the structural systems, the lighting systems, the long-term perspective you had to put on that. I walked away from there just shaking my head. I couldn't believe what was going on there. And so I share that from the perspective that generally, I don't know if you'll, you'll agree with this, but generally the art community, what, what cool idea are they gonna do now? And are they gonna be able to get it done? And I'll tell you, this wasn't a cool idea. This was a piece that caught everybody's attention, everyone's attention from day one. And the execution on their part of these artists, I uh, almost joked with them when they gave me a date it was gonna be finished. I said, is that 2020 or 2021? <laughs> but they were on time. They kept to the detail, they kept with the plan. And I wanna get that word out to the community at large because Incorporating art into the commercial community, into our, uh, into our, our, our heart and soul, is that you do want it delivered. You don't want it to be this cool idea that finds itself, you know, in a tank in the back of a yard somewhere. <laughs> and I just can't throw enough kudos at these two for having put together this, this program. And uh, I, those of you that travel down to the neighborhood and see it, see it when we get down there. I'll tell you, there's a there's a theme that catches your eye. And when you go to the interior of the building, I'll try to, try to share what our connection to the neighbor, nature is. When we market the, market the product, it wasn't about living in the pearl, it was about how close you were to Mount Hood, how close you were to the water systems, how close you were to nature. And this piece really pulled all that together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. talk about the model? Let's have a little bit of uh, discussion of the model. Okay. <laughs> Somehow, people may have seen it before, but 
Yeah, it's, it's heavy. This is a full size mock up that Kurt basically put together for uh, just for figuring out systems for removing the panels and for you know just testing it because it's such a big elaborate piece you can't just make the thing and have it be perfect the first time. Kurt has to mess with it a lot. <laughs> but the panels come off, you can basically see how the collapse goes in. And they're basically just if, if once we stop talking, everybody's welcome to come up and, and take a look at it. But it's just a welded stainless steel. And then if one of the piece breaks, you just have to cut it out, pop it out, and then we can cut out a new piece and put it in. And then there's places. So far so good. Yeah, so far. Yeah, so. uh, but afterwards anybody should at, when, once this is over, feel free to come up and like uh, and talk about this and take a look if you want. It is kind of interesting in here. There's a uh, a lot went in went into figuring all this out. And uh, oh, look, there's questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I would say so. But the idea is that you don't notice that that would impact the design. I mean, the fact that it has to be safety glass, there's a lot. I mean, they had the RACC has, you know, pretty stringent guidelines. Everything has to be reviewed by a conservator. There's a lot of documentation. I had to put together a whole maintenance manual for it. So there's a lot of thought process put into not only durability, but whether or not you can take it down, you know, at some point. And so, a lot of time was spent to make these removable panels. It would have been easier if you could have just buttoned the whole thing up, but uh, a lot of time and effort goes into all of, that, all of that aspect of it, and public safety, durability, all of that stuff. They're pretty, pretty rigid about it, and that's one of the things that's kind of difficult with public art is navigating through all that to a system that works. How did you, um, you have blue and glass color. Yes. Well, who doesn't like blue? <laughs> <laughs> that was quite simply, I don't know, it was just, it was a striking color. We had some other color options, but the blue is the one that kind of resonated with everybody. So, you know, often we'll, we'll uh, do some mock-ups and that's a lot of what Dave does. He'll, he'll kind of uh, play with the, uh, the presentation, uh, Photoshop and things like that and, and, and give some options, but the blue was the one that stuck. The green and red looked like Christmas too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is going back to earlier when you talked about another project where you mentioned carving glass. And I'm trying to understand in my simple mind how one carves glass. I think, I just can't imagine what that must be. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, in the case of these cutting out these little these little forms and these shapes, this is a water jet cutting machine. So it's basically plotted out by a computer. You've got sort of a cutting material that's you know forced through the water feed in a very focused kind of way, and then it just it just wears that that down. And in the same case with everything, almost everything that I do is sand. I call it sand carved because it's basically a rubber stencil that's applied to the surface. Uh, drawing the design on, uh, you know, cutting the areas out with uh, an exacto blade, lifting the areas of tape up, and then slowly wearing the surface of the glass down with the sandblasting, you know, with the nozzle. So your hand sweeping, you know, this this uh, nozzle with this aluminum oxide that's being forced out at you know 40 pounds pressure, and then you just kind of you know wear that surface of the glass down. So it's a lot of you know, uh, getting a feel for it and how does it, you know, how fast does it cut through? It, it doesn't cut through very fast, but it's very, uh, you know, so it's, it's time consuming and it's very hands-on, the, the, the process that I use. With the scraps of glass, do you do a mosaic piece? I, well, what's like with the leftover pieces? <laughs> Well, we, most of the leftover pieces John has over there in storage, in case we ever need another one. 
no, I, uh, we're like by the time we had it all together and functioning right and everything else, uh, none of us really wanted to see any more pieces of glass. <laughs> I, I hate to say that, but plus with the process that it's been through with the you know two layers and the plastic and everything, it's not that much you can do with it because you can't put it in a kiln or anything like that. So we did have a lot of garbage, but it was okay. <laughs> Oh, that was at Da Vinci's workshop, Kurt's uh, former studio in uh, just south of the airport in Seattle. Oh, so it came from Seattle? Yes. On a, what, a truck? What? On a trailer, a beautiful, really quality trailer. <laughs> the, that we was had, an We adventure. worked with a sign company to help us erect it and everything, so we used some of their equipment, which was somewhat dubious, but they got the job done. <laughs> But Kurt, you know, like all those pieces, like almost everything that I've made, it's all been done at Kurt's place, you know, and half the things I've done have been partially designed by Aaron. So, I mean, part of what works with this is that, like when I had kind of stopped carving and gone on to do more public art in these larger pieces, it was kind of developing that team. And then, you know, Press and I kind of spoke the same language. So I was able to just bring my team to help realize these larger visions, you know, and so, and we spoke the same language, and Preston's a sweetheart. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always a lot of, you know, the um, dialogue going on with any public art call, you know, regional, um, you know, what are the, the needs of the community to have, you know, something in there, you know, in that place, or, um, so we often, I mean, so far, it's just been, like, the first idea always seems to be the best. I mean, we tend to, like, oh, yeah, this would be good. And we might have, you know, a second or third option, but we we generally just um, uh, kind of throw something out there. It's usually very, um, you know, apparent uh, based on the use of the space. You know, like in the case of the courthouse, that was uh, that was uh, these big big window panels were just made sense uh, to work with that space. It was very unobtrusive, um, and and. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of the same rules apply in terms of design, um, concept. Um, you know, what what do we want to represent? Um, maybe there's a particular story, and we can use some symbolism within the story, or we can um, kind of create that effect. You know, like the northern the northern lights in the case of the the panels up in Alaska. Um, you know, it's a, it's really effective because it's a very dark, you know, kind of gray space. And it was really, you know, devoid of color on yes. any, on every level. And so we, uh, we came up with that um, and, and it worked. Yeah, and I think that like with, uh, I used to do a lot of retail pieces and I haven't really done that in a while. And the thing about public art that's so fun and kind of engaging is that it's free for everybody. It's not something you have to walk into a museum, no offense to museum, to see, <laughs> or into a gallery for that matter. You know, there's people who are just not comfortable with that. They're never gonna go into a gallery. And public art puts this in your space, in your home, in your living room, and it's for everybody. And so there's, everybody kind of comes into the thought process. The guy who's gonna try to climb it to, what a little kid might think about it, you know? So there's, you do, you think about the community and you think about the piece in a larger, I think in a larger way. And I think that it also enriches people's lives even without them realizing it sometimes, you know? Like these things are things people walk by. And I like to make things personally, and I think Preston's work too, it appeals to a really wide audience, like a child could enjoy it or an old guy could enjoy it who, 
you know, or a property developer can enjoy it. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? It's, but so that's kind of the intention. So, and that's a wonderful thing because we get to take our creativity and, and, and share it with everybody in a very intimate way that way. Hey guys, so let's have um, two more questions. Yes, go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing this broader vision of Native American art and glass. But imagine that a year from now, I'm walking down the street with friends that are visiting Portland for the first time, and they come across this piece. And I say, what do you see there? And then a sort of a mini cartoon of you, and not with horns, but the angel, <laughs> is whispering the story of this piece that you want me to relate to them. What's that story? Well, you know, the, the, the simple version is the uh, raven and the, you know, with the sun, releasing the sun into the sky. The, um, the bottom figure is kind of, is a wolf design, but the top figure is, is the sun, uh, the little red um, orb that's in, in the beak of the sun, and, or, or in the, in the uh, beak of the uh, raven. Um, and oftentimes in design work, you'll see Raven holding this little red ball in, in its mouth. And so um, that's, that's kind of simply, that, that's kind of where my mind's been at, you know, that in terms of uh, working on this show for the Museum of Glass as well. So, you know, we're often, you know, working with those kinds of um, uh, stories. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you see it and you're, you run into it and you're, you know, make whatever impression it makes on you, you know, each one of these public art pieces is like, you know, a key to a door, you know, if you really, if it moves you, like, there's a whole world there that you can explore from it. You may just walk by it and never see it, but to somebody else, it may change their life, you know, you just don't know, but the potential is in there in these pieces. Can I, can I use this as a segue into your point is a thousand percent, or your question is a thousand percent. I have been waiting now for several months for them to put their story together on a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> Deep oh, pressure. Wow. Okay. I've, I've, got, I've got a napkin right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Raven. All right, let's have a... <laughs> Next time you can just email that, John. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for Preston being here. Um, we appreciate the art. And I want to say, I mean, from a Native American's perspective of being a Portlander, my partner Paul Lundy and I moved here 34 years ago. And the only Indian art we saw was at Washington Park, those two Indians standing there, the white people are coming. That was it. <laughs> Today, you drive around the city, you have Lillian Pitt on the waterfront, you have Greg Robinson on the bridge, you have uh, David Boxley inside of Whiting Kennedy, you have Preston now and David down here in the Pearl. So as a Native American here in the city, this is really a great thing. To us, it's a land. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we just hope to expand it. Yes. We continue to work through art murals, through sculptures, through wall art, everything we can do to bring more Native art. Because our city is full of Native Americans. We have a lot of a huge population here. Uh, Paul, Paul and I worked on a brochure that we distributed to the Multnomah, Multnomah County in the city of Portland, a brochure focused on our community. Inside that brochure, we had a lot of new art that was local public art. So it was really proud, proud for us to put that together because 10 years ago we did that same brochure, we had no new art to talk about. So we're talking about it now. So really to me it's a beginning, so thank you again for being here, and I hope you all come down to see the art. It's going to be lit up. It's going to be beautiful. So again, I should go. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Philip. I mean, Philip brought Kristen up to my studio uh, several years ago, and I think that that really stuck. You know, that's that's really how a lot of this um, came to be. And so, thank you for your 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 uh, you're always supportive and trying to bring people together. And I really appreciate that. It's been really an honor to, to have this uh, you know, piece down here and um, to come down and visit it and see it there it makes us very, both very proud. Yes. 
Sure. <laughs> I can't say it better than that. <laughs> okay. I don't think I could say anything better than Philip Jeds, but um, we're very honored to have both of you and to join our friendship circle, I would say, and you're welcome back anytime. I d am remiss in one thing that I did not say earlier, and that here at the museum, in the Center for Contemporary Native Art, that's our gallery that is focused on contemporary artists, we have an exhibit now of glass. It's called Not Fragile, and I don't know if any of you had a chance to even see it today, but please try to go by, I believe it's there until June. And so you'll see a lot of the same themes and artists mentioned uh, there that are mentioned here tonight.